Hi, it's Dwyer. Today is Friday, May 18th, 2018. Let's talk about a great fight. An absolutely great fight. There are times when the sport of boxing gets it right. When they exceed expectations, right? You might recall the Anthony Joshua Vladimir Klitschko fight. I thought that was one of those moments. I believe this fight between the reigning Ring Magazine lightweight champion, right? He also has a WBA or had the WBA super belt for the division, Jorge Linares, right? Taking on two time Olympic gold medalist. Vasyl Lomachenko, a man who was trying to become a three-division champion in his 12th professional fight. Now again, this is the way the sport is when it hits its top level, right? This is boxing the way it ought to be. The fight was at Madison Square Garden, the same place where Joe Fraser, unbeaten heavyweight champion, met Muhammad Ali, unbeaten heavyweight champion in their first matchup, the legendary fight, right? Let me also say, too, that boxing got this one right in more ways than one. The fight was on ESPN here in the United States. I know it was on Box Nation in the UK. It got great ratings, great ratings. You didn't have to be an HBO or a Showtime subscriber to watch this fight. Let me also say too that the fight was excellent. It's one of those fights that you want to get a tape of and just keep it in your cabinet for when you want to remind yourself of what a great fight looks like. Understand at the time of the stoppage by Lomachenko, the fight was a draw on the three judges scorecards. Right? Think about it. High-profile fight, high-profile venue, big-time boxing crowd. Big time. And these two fighters put on a show. Now, to the gamblers, my core constituency, understand that Lomachenko goes off as a double-digit favorite. Right? In my pre-fight video, the bet I recommended, was to take Linares plus 650. Those were the odds at the time of the video. And to hedge the play with the over nine and a half rounds at a minus 130. Folks, the hedge won. Let's do the math. The fight ends at two minutes and eight seconds of the 10th round. The minute it got by, the one minute and 30 mark of the 10th round, you were a winner, right? Of all the bets on the board, the over nine and a half was one of the very best you could have taken. I have no doubt there are people watching this video who took Lomachenko straight up, right? In the comment section to this video, tell the world what odds you got when the fight tipped off. Right? I'm just saying here that the minus 130 you got on the over was much better than any odds you got on Lomachenko simply to win the fight. Let's go one step further, too. With the hedge, you got a chance to swing for the fences, a plus 650. Well, we now know that the idea of Jorge Linares who knocks down Lomachenko in the sixth round, <laughs> who enters the ring as one of the best fighters, in my opinion, pound for pound in the sport, right? This was his fourth defense of his ring magazine lightweight championship, right? The idea that Jorge Linares should be a plus 650 to any fighter, even Lomachenko, who wins the fight by KO, is simply preposterous, right? With the hedge, because your possible expected winnings were plus 650 on one side, you could have put more than 50% of your play 
on the minus 130 over nine and a half rounds. And if you did that, let me just say congratulations. You won a nice sum. Now let's talk about the fight because I understand. Right? For many of you, you're really here for boxing, not gambling, and I completely respect that. So, let's shine a spotlight right now on Vasyl Lomachenko, and let's talk about what makes him one of the very best fighters in the sport, pound for pound. Right? I want people to understand the talent level we're dealing with here. So, in future fights, you can think about his strengths and you can think about his weaknesses. Right? Let me also say, too, what I said in the pre-fight video, and it's something I stand by. While Vasyl Lomachenko is one of the very best in the sport pound for pound, right? He's also overrated. Any time in a fight like this against a very difficult opponent, a proven opponent, right? Understand, Linares has more knockouts in his professional career than Lomachenko has fights. Understand, Linares has fought on different continents in his career, right? He's been up before the bright lights in the past. Right? Anytime a fighter, no matter how good he is, is a greater than 10 to 1 favorite against a credible opponent, anytime I can get a fighter the level of Jorge Linares at a plus 650, then you know that the favorite's overrated and the bet makes itself. In other words, you should have a list of the best in boxing, right? Golovkin. Um, Alexander Usyk, Terence Crawford, and you should have in your mind a number at which you know you're going to pick that fighter in a fight, right? So if you hear that Mikey Garcia is going off at a plus 650, right, your only two questions, at least to this observer, should be, one, is he healthy, right, because you... You don't want to pick a guy who's hurt before the first punch is landed. Is he healthy? And two, is this fight in his weight class? In this fight, you had the added dynamic of the underdog actually being the regular at 135. In other words, Lomachenko was coming to Linares' weight class. And the casino still gave you a plus 650. Right? Understand, once the casino offers you crazy odds like that, that opens the door to other bets. In other words, you can then say, okay, is there a bet on the board that I could hedge these long odds against? In this case, it was the over nine and a half rounds. As I said in the pre-fight video, I would have preferred the over-under to be a little bit lower, but it's okay. We took the nine and a half, we got the minus 130, and it delivered. I'll concede it was hair raising. It delivered by 38 seconds. Do the math. Well, let's talk about Vasyl Lomachenko. Now understand, as good as he looked in the fight, and he looked great. Understand, I thought both guys looked great at different times. Right? As good as Vassal looked, understand there was a part to his game that you didn't even get a chance to see in full bloom. Vassal Lomachenko fights this fight out of a southpaw stance. Just understand that, like Tyson Fury, like James DeGale, like Terence Crawford, Vassal Lomachenko's ambidextrous. He fights out of a southpaw stance because he's dealing with a righty who has a pretty good jab. Were he to deal with a lefty, Vassal could have fought out of a right-handed orthodox stance. Understand, as good as he looked, you only saw part of his game. 
Now let's talk about his traits. You've heard me in videos and talking about some other fighters say, you know, this guy, he's just not defensively blessed, right? Understand if you ever want to know what I consider a defensively blessed fighter to look like, just look at a tape of Vasyl Lomachenko. He's defensively blessed. Understand, usually, as Anthony Crawler knows, usually, Jorge Linares is landing more punches than he lands on Vasyl Lomachenko. Usually, Linares is a guy who will dive into the pocket, who's fast-handed, who throws combinations, right? He'll come in, he'll bust you up. He's offensive. Here in this fight, you didn't get the full idea of Linares' offensive capability because Lomachenko was that good defensively. First off, he has a feel for what punches are coming. Right? We've all watched the fight where a guy is here and the other guy is throwing right hands that seem to land with regularity. And the guy just looks unaware of how to even move away from the punch. How to even block the punch. How to duck away from the punch. Understand that Lomachenko just has an innate understanding of what the other guy can throw. A lot of great defense is not just anticipation but anticipation caused by taking away the other guy's weapons. So you'll notice Lomachenko, who's fast. He's very fast, right? He's the faster man in this fight against a fast opponent. But as fast as Lomachenko is, you'll notice Lomachenko, for stretches of the fight, has his hands up. This is a guy with a great upper body. He has his hands up. He knows Linares is going to try to come in with left hands because he's taken away the right hand, right? He's looking at punches that he knows he's going to prevent from landing. And he knows that his opponent's best option is the punch he's prepared to block and roll away from. Let me say this too. As great an athlete, and he's one of the best athletes in boxing, as great an athlete as Lomachenko is, ambidextrous, coordinated, right? He's not leaving things to chance. Again, he has his hands up, right? The guy, the guy has the reflexes to fight you with his hands down. He could have tried to just dodge. We've seen fighters try that. But this guy, great athlete, still has his hands up. There's a certain fundamental soundness to the guy's game that really helps his defense. Let me also say, too, that when you watch him, and again, understand, he's fighting Southpaw, could have been fighting Orthodox. You'll notice that the guy can move. He can circle the pocket both ways. In other words, this isn't the guy who can you know, move away from an opponent's right hand. But then if the opponent is ambidextrous or switches it up and starts throwing power lefts, doesn't really move that well. Lomachenko has some of the best legs in the sport, right? By that I mean the guy can literally just move any which way he needs to. It's like being on one of those segways. Right? He can move this way, or he can move that way, and he's seamless. In other words, he's still coordinated. When he's on the move, he still has his offensive game intact. Right? You'll even notice, too, that at times, he's able to just swing out to the point where he's practically behind the guy who was in front of him. In other words, the guy's movements are unpredictable. Let me also say, too, that we're just talking defense. He has an elastic upper body. 
and great reflexes that allow him to not just block shots on his forearms, but also to duck under shots. Right? Again, the guy has the upper body movement. Don't be fooled by the hand. He'll have a hand up, but he'll often not even use it. He'll duck completely under the shots that are coming back. Right? Let me say, too, in part because of his innate feel for what's coming, the guy can jump away from punches. So there are times where Linares surprises him, and Linares has the longer reach. Lenaric has more ring coverage, right? Lenaric can hit you from farther away. But there are times when Lenaric jumps forward and Vasyl Lomachenko is able to jump backwards. In other words, he's not one of these guys with cement legs who can't move, right? He has cat-like reflexes that allow him to maintain a cushion between you and him when he wants one. Let me say this too, right? In terms of his offense, he's a combination puncher. What that means is he's not Floyd Mayweather. Mayweather's a pot shotter. Mayweather's a guy who wants to hit you flush, then feels that he scored the point on the scorecard, then Mayweather will back away, right? Lomachenko is more like Ray Leonard. Right? So he hits you with a shot, he hits you clean, and then he keeps hitting you. Tenth round. I know the press is focusing on the liver shot, the last punch Lomachenko throws. But understand what sets up the liver shot is Lomachenko is hitting Linares with head shots. Linares is getting hit with a bevy of head shots. And you'll notice, once Loma starts in that round, Loma's not done. He's not there to win a round on a judge's scorecard. Right? He's actually hitting with headshots, and then the smaller man is moving in on the bigger man. Right? It's the headshots that set up the body shot. Let me say this, too. I know Linares is upset that the ref stopped it. The ref did a great job in stopping it, because what I want people to do is to revisit that 10th round. Right? Linares is so stunned by the body shot that when he gets off the canvas, right, he gets off the canvas, the referee's looking at him. Now, at that moment, normally, no matter how badly hurt you are, normally boxers will try to have eye contact with the ref. Try to convince the ref that, hey, I can continue. You know, hey, I just got buzzed. It's, it's no big deal, right? Here, Linares' body is so gone. And keep in mind, I took Linares in the fight. I was hoping for the plus 650. I'm on the Linares side of the play. <laughs> but Linares' body is so gone that when he gets off the canvas, look at the film. The ref looks him in the eyes, then Linares bends over. Literally, can't stand upright. He bends over. The ref is watching him bend over. Then Linares bends back up. Doesn't do what a lot of fighters do. Raises gloves to make the ref know, hey, look, I'm here. Look, I'm coordinated. I'm ready to fight. No, he doesn't do that. His hands never come up like this. They can't. Folks, I thought the ref did Linares a favor by stopping this fight. Understand, Loma had just busted off not just the left of the body, but Loma had just busted off a combination. I want people to look at the last 20 seconds of the fight. Loma has just busted off a combination because that's who he is. Let me say something else about Loma's combinations, and let me say this to the Ray Leonard cr crowd. I know, I know, trust me, I know, Loma doesn't punch like Ray Leonard, right? Ray Leonard was a finisher. Look at the Donnie Lalonde fight, right? Loma, by contrast, throws combinations, but you'll notice the punches are short, right? Because Loma 
always has his hands like this. He's not the combination type puncher a Ray Leonard was who's winding up during a combination. You'd see a Ray Leonard combination and punches are coming from down here, right? He's, you know, Loma's not that way. Loma always has his hands close by. But understand, because he's throwing the shorter punches, he throws much shorter punches than Linares, right? It increases his hand speed. He has more hand speed than Linares, right? Let me say this too. Some guys are counter punchers and they're waiting for you to do something before they do something. Loma's a switch. He can lead, he can counter. So, understand in this fight where he moves up to the lightweight division, he's not even a lightweight, he moves up to the lightweight division. Understand that he's actually the guy hunting Linares down. He's not waiting for openings. Folks, he's creating openings. Right? He's the hunter for most of the fight. It's really a tribute to Linares who I'm sure is accustomed to being the hunter in most of his fights, that Linares has as much of a back foot game as he does in dealing with a fast-handed opponent who's pushing the issue. Let me say this too. Loma isn't that tall. So Loma can fight small. Right? You'll notice he gets inside on Linares and Linares doesn't have a lot of surface to hit, right? Loma knows how to lean forward. Then, of course, he's throwing combinations and he's moving, right? Loma, you know, left to right, right to left, doesn't matter. He has great legs, right? I got the feeling that this was a tale of two fights. First half of the fight, I thought Linares takes the first round, but the first half of the fight, Right? It's Loma being smaller than Linares expected. Being the hunter more than Linares expected. Linares not having a lot to hit, not having a lot of time to think. I thought Lomachenko wins most of the first half of the fight. Then you get to the second part of the fight. Get the knockdown in the sixth round. I thought Linares comes out, makes the adjustments, We'll talk about that. Wins the seventh round. Eighth round could have gone either way. I thought Linares clearly wins the ninth round. I thought Linares comes out and has one of his best moments of the fight at the beginning of the tenth round. He gets Lomachenko back up against the ropes momentarily. And it looks like Linares has figured out that you can't rely on a jab against Loma. You have to throw hooks. You have to throw counter power shots. Right? Of course, the 10th round ends with Loma getting the KO. Let me say this too. Loma, he's a little guy. You don't think of him as a knockout threat. But my goodness, he's excellent. He's excellent at cutting off the ring. I mean, excellent. Was that Loma or Roberto Duran? Right? Lomachenko is a little bit of a contradiction. Right? He's the little guy with hand speed who you think is just in there to win rounds. And instead, he's cutting off the ring and he's on his front foot hunting you. Now, let's talk about possible storm clouds. Right? Let me be one of the first to say I'd take Mikey Garcia over Loma. You wouldn't even have to bribe me with a plus 650. Right? I'm guessing Loma's so overrated right now that Mikey's probably the underdog in that fight. Even though Mikey's never lost, if he quits today as a boxing hall of famer, right, has had dramatic KOs at 135, has fought above 135, I'm guessing because of how in love with Loma the public is, that you would get Mikey Garcia, right, at a discount. He'd be the underdog, which I'm sure Mikey Garcia fans would love. But let me just say this. Loma is not a back foot length guy. 
In other words, I didn't see the version of his game where the other guy comes forward and Loma decides he's just going to set traps. Right? He doesn't have that Vitaly Klitschko part of his game where he just leans back, lets everything end here. Right? Sticks a jab, moves around, lets the other guy tire himself out a little bit. Right? That's not Loma's game. Ray Leonard has that part of his game, right? That's Ray on his back foot against Marvin Hagler, for example. Right? Loma is not really a guy who goes on his back foot much, even with the great legs. Now, the reason that's a cause for concern is because he's now gaining weight. He's fighting at lightweight. He has three titles. The next step up is going to be 140. The guys he's fighting are going to feel that he doesn't have a big punch, right? He gets a stoppage here, but folks, it's in the 10th round, right? It's off a liver shot, right? You didn't get the feeling that his punches had a lot of power, right? Linares isn't holding on for life earlier in the fight. So I'm guessing a bigger man, let's say a Mikey Garcia, is going to feel that, look, if this turns into a shootout and we trade bullets, I think Mikey's going to feel that his bullets have higher caliber than Lomachenko's, right? Because Loma doesn't have that Ali-type game where, you know, you're sticking a jab and you're just moving. The other guy can't find you in the ring. Because Loma's a guy who likes to engage, that increases the chances for trouble against heavy-handed sluggers, right? And those are the guys who Loma has to fight to enhance his legacy at this point. In other words, if I'm Loma, I'm thinking about Relic at 140. I'm thinking about Mikey Garcia at 135, right? I'm not thinking about the Rigondos of the world anymore. Let me say this too. Loma doesn't have a slower pace mode. So he gets caught. That's not a slip, folks. He gets caught in the sixth round. He goes down. He gets up. Now, I believe the top level of the sport, guys who get buzzed, you want them to be able to, the next round, slow the fight down. Right? Whether that's clinching you, whether that's fighting on their back foot and dancing away from you. You don't want your guy to have to be around the pocket trading bullets with the guy who just knocked him down. Right? You don't want that. Let me just say, I haven't seen the fight yet. And granted, there's only been 12 pro fights, right? I haven't seen the fight yet where Loma has shown us a slower pace mode. In other words, he gets dropped in the sixth round. Guess what? In the seventh round, Loma, again, physically the smaller man, is in there trading shots with Jorge Linares. Right? You know, you just wondered to yourself, wow, you know, if Loma gets really hurt, hurt worse than this in a fight, right? Not just buzzed, but dazed and confused. Does he have the skills to be able to stay away from a slugger hunting him down? I'm not sure. Right? Understand, a puncher only has to be right once. If Mikey Garcia gets off a left hook on Loma and hurts him badly, does Loma have the skills to move away for a few rounds and not stand there and trade with a slugger? I believe that's still an open question, right? One of the other problems with Loma is Loma is a little bit small. In other words, he doesn't look like he has the reach Jorge Linares has here, right? For Loma to land, he has to be like a bee, come close to you and throw punches, right? That concerns me. That concerns me a little bit. Let's talk about Jorge Linares briefly. I know the video is almost 30 minutes. 
Let me say, um, this is a highly skilled fighter. Just understand, Linares isn't accustomed to being on his back foot as much as he is in this fight. Right? You saw high-level stuff here. So just like you saw a left-handed version of Lomachenko, you saw a back foot version of Jorge Linares. It's a tribute to both men that they are so skilled that Linares, a guy who prefers to be front foot throwing combinations, is able to deal with being back foot and measured, right? Let me just say too, the six round right hand is beautiful just from a boxing purist standpoint because it's a counter right hand. More importantly, revisit that round. Just like Tony Bellew, Bellew, right, tries a left hook that misses on David Hay moments before he makes the adjustment, tries a slightly different angle, same left hook, and lands flush, dropping Hay for the last time, right? What I, well, dropping Hay in the middle of the ring, I'm not sure if it's the last time as I sit here. Um, in that 10th round, you're going to notice, you're going to notice that Linares hits Lomachenko with a straight right hand about 10 seconds before he drops Lomachenko with a counter straight right hand. In other words, Linares is making adjustments. Folks, he loses rounds 2, 3, 4, and 5. By the end of this fight, by the end of this fight, the fight's even on the judges' scorecards. Linares is adaptive, reactive. He's figuring out the punches that work, and he's revisiting them seconds later on even a fast guy like Lomachenko. Quite frankly, I thought Linares was the one making adjustments. One of the problems with Loma is that the fight Loma fought in the first half of the fight when he was successful is the same fight he fights in the second half of the fight with diminishing returns. You didn't get the feeling that Loma could make the adjustments that Linares can make, right? Let me say this too. Seventh round, Linares starts throwing more right hooks to the body, right? He's had success throwing left hooks to the body, right? Lenara starts to realize that if he dampens his jab a little bit and is just a little bit more patient, he's going to have openings for counter power shots, right? Let me say this too. The ninth round is one of Lenara's best rounds. In other words, don't be fooled by the KO. In the 10th round, Linares actually is building momentum. In fact, he starts the 10th round well. <coughs> he starts the 10th round well. Well, let me just close with this. If you're going to fight Lomachenko, you need to be prepared to be on your back foot. Don't get fooled by sizes. Don't get fooled by the weigh-in where you look and you see one guy is bigger than Lomachenko, right? Just understand Lomachenko is more front foot than back foot, right? Let me say this too. You want to aim for Loma's body. Loma's so committed to being close to you in high volume that it seemed to me that an orthodox fighter can land that lead left hook to Lomachenko's body. Also, Loma's not a guy who knows how to fight without throwing punches. He's not a guy who dances around the ring and looks at you like Ali looks at Liston in the first round of their first fight. Count the number of punches Ali throws in that round. No, Loma needs to be active with his hands. Right? He's a great fighter. Right? We're putting him under a microscope because he's a great fighter. But Loma needs to be active with his hands. What that means 
is that an opponent is going to have counterpunching opportunities. So what future opponents against Lomachenko need to practice is they need to practice throwing hooks on their back foot what old timers like Sugar Ray Robinson called an anchor punch or they need to practice throwing these hooks in transition in other words they're on their back foot they're shifting to their front foot they have it timed right and of course they need to look at that six round look at the counter straight right hand that drops Lomachenko and they need to be prepared to throw that punch against him the punch lands flush it's noteworthy because Lomachenko who has a hand up for hooks to his head is caught naked on the straight right hand in that sixth round anyway that's how I see the fight Please understand, I took Lomachenko over Rigondeau. I recognize that this guy is one of the best in the sport, pound for pound. But understand, this is a gambling site. Boxing's a competitive sport. When Lomachenko, who just became a three weight class champion, is fighting another guy who's already a three weight class champion, and Jorge Linares, Neither guy should be a plus 650. Neither guy should be a double-digit favorite to win, right? By the way, the gap between the double-digit favorite for Lomachenko simply to win and the plus 650 for Linares is what makes casinos money, right? There's a VIG involved. Just understand, the odds here were skewed, right? The right gambling play here was the over nine and a half that delivered, right? Just understand, though, that the real goal was to go deep on Lomachenko at, excuse me, on Linares at plus 650. He didn't win the fight, but I'm just telling you going forward. In fights between two competitive guys where after nine rounds, the judges have the fight a draw. You want some money on those plus 650s. This was a competitive fight between two guys, in my opinion, headed for the Hall of Fame. Right? Loma's a great fighter. The odds were ridiculous. I still maintain that. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. And for those of you who stuck around for 36 minutes and 50 seconds, let me just say thanks. Thanks for stopping by.